In this edition of Art Rocks, an artist whose treehouse paintings imagine a world of love and peace. Now, here I am, five years later, and over 8,000 paintings to my name now. The ordinary becomes the extraordinary. Magritte sought to reveal the mystery that he believed to be latent in every object. An artist and entertainer produces paintings with breathtaking speed. The cool thing about what I do is it's like children looking at clouds. And a glass blower adds an emotional touch to her creations. The moment of truth comes and I just shut up and I listen to whatever is inside and it says, take it or leave it. It's all ahead on this edition of Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine, and this is Art Rocks. We begin today with folk artist Hank Holland from Lockport, Louisiana, whose paintings include scenes from a simpler time, when life centered on the church with an occasional fado do thrown in. He also imagines delightful tree houses in his paintings. As a disabled artist, Holland has continually challenged himself to overcome the limitations of cerebral palsy. My name is Hank Holland. Uh, I'm from a little town in Lockport, Louisiana, the Fouche Parish. I've been painting for five years, self-taught Louisiana folk artist. Started painting uh, with the absence of my mother. My mother uh, died in 2007, and I had a void that I had to fill, of course. I have a wife, I had a son, but with that void of not having a parent left alive, I had to fill that void with something. And what I did was I started painting. And for one painting, it turned into two, then three, then Fifteen, and now here I am, five years later, um, completely full-time artist, and over eight thousand paintings to my name now that I have painted and sold. I have about six to seven, eight different series I do. My juke joint series, where I have the juke joints, and I name the juke joints, Zodico uh, juke joint, on my so-called life series. Well, I have the church and the graveyard and the new joint, the baptism. I like to do the baptismal series with the angels flying out behind it. Uh, I do a lot of Louisiana series with the camps on stilts and at nighttime and, uh, with the wildlife. And I have another series called the Treehouse series, where it's just the treehouse with a bunch of bright colors and uh, love, hope, faith, uh, and that. When I was growing up, with my disability, the children, of course, gave me a, a hard time. So my father built me a tree house in the tree behind the house. That's where I found who Hank was. And one morning, I was going to school, and I was about eight, and I told my mom, I said, nobody loves me, I'm disabled, and I'm handicapped. Nobody loves me. So when I came home from school that day, on, on the tree, they had a big old heart, but I love you, Mom. As I started painting and finding myself, my art, that this all came out of me. And I started painting tree houses. And they progressed to having a house in the tree with an outhouse and a love, faith, hope, uh, grace, kindness. Um, having the kids, having people go up the side of the uh, tree playing the trumpets, um, a tire swing. Uh, the outhouse, I always put an outhouse in the tree houses. Because I tell everybody, you, you rode the outhouse every day, you put all your trash in your life in it. It's kind of symbolic. Having cerebral palsy or any kind of disability, um, you're constantly trying to um, overcome it. I mean, it's this it's everyday uh, challenge. I'm blessed enough that I can drive and I can walk and I can. I can um, talk, I mean, it may be hard to understand me, but I'm blessed that I can do that. 
a blessing I could paint. One of the greatest gifts in my life is to be able to make a living for my family using my artwork. Hank Holland has established a foundation for the arts to provide a scholarship each year to a disabled high school student who is pursuing an education in the visual or performing arts. Find out more about his work on his Facebook page, Baby Jane Studios. And now, here's a look at some of the upcoming art events happening across Louisiana. For more information on these events, visit our website at lpb.org slash art rocks. And you can find more arts events like these at countryroadsmag.com. For the first time ever, select works by the Belgian surrealist René Magritte have been brought to the US to tour the country. We get an inside look from curator Anne Umland at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. This is the first major museum exhibition of Magritte's work in New York City to be held in over a generation. And it is the very, very first ever to look at how and when did Magritte become Magritte. The title of the exhibition, Magritte, The Mystery of the Ordinary, 1926 to 1938, began with a phrase that Magritte's close friend and contemporary, a Belgian surrealist, Paul Nouget, said about Magritte's work in 1931. To look at Magritte's paintings and to turn away from them again and to confront the world itself was to find that reality had been altered. There are no longer any ordinary things. Magritte sought to reveal the mystery that he believed to be latent in every object. And so we ended up putting those two words together, mystery and ordinary, because I think with Magritte, he's always creating works that go back and forth between things that are so recognizable and nameable, and yet he makes them deeply mysterious. Magritte has a rather unique background in that he trained both in a fine arts academy and as a commercial artist. I think this kind of bold, graphic, legible, identifiable clarity that he achieves in his painting surely is informed by a commercial background. For me, the beauty of doing a show that is a slice like this, that's sort of this intensely innovative 13-year period, is that you get to go in depth. The exhibition in its most basic is chronological. The Lost Jockey is one of a whole group of collages that Magritte made in 1926 and 1927. It combines a number of Magritte's early techniques and images and types of materials. So there are these strange forms that look a little bit like chess pieces that Magritte called bilboquet. And in English, the word bilboquet refers to a child's cup and ball toy. There's also in this picture the idea of the stage, the curtains open on either side. He's telling us this is some magical, surreal place. The central element is this charcoal-drawn figure of a horse and jockey. And Magritte's friends at that moment identified that figure with the artist himself sort of galloping off into the unknown of the avant-garde. Surrealism was a movement that was founded by a Paris poet named André Breton in 1924. And at its essence, it asked people to take nothing for granted. And I think that whole idea that behind ordinary, everyday appearances, there is always another 
reality or surreality is just key to understanding Magritte's larger project of defamiliarizing the familiar or helping us to look at the world around us with fresh eyes. The treachery of images is probably Magritte's most direct interrogation of what it means to make a picture and what the act of representation entails. He presents you with this absolutely legible image of a pipe and then underneath it in sort of school boy or girl script writes ceci n'est pas une pipe. This is not a pipe and that immediately sort of throws everything up into question. Neither words nor pictures are ever the same as the things themselves. They are just conventions. There are a number of works in this show that have never been seen in the United States before. Among them, for instance, not to be reproduced, this anti-portrait from 1937 of Magritte's great patron, the eccentric British collector, Edward James. All the different themes that you see throughout the show of doubling and repetition and mirroring and concealment, I think are so beautifully encapsulated in this portrait. And just to keep things from being too obvious, the book by Edgar Allan Poe, who was one of Magritte's favorite authors, is reflected in the conventional way in the mirror. So right away you have these two contradictory systems and the more you look, the more that you see things that don't add up. Magritte's captivating creations are currently touring the country. Presently, they can be seen at the Menil Collection in Houston, Texas. After a desperate bid for financial relief became a global phenomenon, artist Dan Dunn explores how his unique method of painting earned him the respect and admiration of millions. I was upside down on my credit cards trying to pay for kids, uh, five children and we were trying to figure out how we were going to get them to college. My wife, she said, what are, we, what are we going to do? I said, well, I'm going to rent a mini warehouse, and I've got this idea, and I'm going to throw some paint. I draped it in plastic. I rehearsed for a year and a half, and then I had my first show for Fourth of July. And I uh, did Statue of Liberty in a minute and a half. And the crowd just went crazy. I built a web page and it attracted the attention of a Las Vegas producer. And he had a show in Atlantic City. So we painted Ray Charles and Lady Liberty every night. Three months after that, he sent me the video and I was able to post it on YouTube. We were getting uh, 85,000 views an hour and it was just insane. All of a sudden our life was changed and people were hiring us. We'd get 30 to 50 offers a day to play all over the world. American artist, Dun Dun. The first year we did 100 cities in 11 countries. I've got over 150 pieces in my repertoire now from doing the custom, so it keeps me growing all the time. Uh, when I do a piece, I get images off the web, and I study them, I put them into Photoshop, I make sure they look good this big, and I make sure they look good from the back of the room. Then I take them out, and then I start practicing, and I learn them right side up, and then I learn them upside down and I memorize the shapes because I've got to get up on stage and hit everything I need just with the shapes. And then I choreograph it to music for uh, emotional impact. The cool thing about what I do is 
it's like children looking at clouds. You know, you, uh, you try to guess what it is, and I try to hide it as long as I can. And you guess, and you guess, and you guess, and then I show you. It's either what you guessed, or it's something different. And if I can surprise you and show you something different, the emotional impact that happens is like electricity, like a magic trick, and goes through the audience. And that's what turns me on. I consider myself an artist. I went to art school, but I'm also an entertainer. I consider myself an entertainer more, because I have to be on stage. I have to have nerves of steel up there. I have to have confidence. And uh, I was also a musician for 10 years. I played in a garage band for 10 years. I played guitar. So all of these things, uh, being a caricaturist, doing wax on, wax off, uh, five minute drawings for events for 30 years. This is kind of the culmination of everything I've been working on my whole life. And I'm just having the time of my life. You can find out more about Dan Dunn's unique style and see examples of his work at paintjam.com. Next, we learn about another of Louisiana's treasures. Each week on Art Rocks, we celebrate and explore an artistic or cultural element with unique ties to Louisiana. This week, we visit the Liberty Theatre. Eunice, Louisiana is home to the Liberty Theater, a self-proclaimed premier temple of amusement when it opened in 1924. The Liberty hosted vaudeville acts and silent films and later talkies, as well as plays, musical comedies, and opera. The theater remained a center for entertainment in the region until it was closed down in the late 70s. Like many buildings of its era, the Liberty Theater might have become a victim of the wrecking ball. But the city government in Eunice was convinced that the Liberty might have more life in its bones and another purpose for the community. The city of Eunice bought the theater in 1986, seeing to its restoration and renovation. In one year, it was ready for the start of a live show that would become a landmark in the Cajun community and enjoyed anywhere French is spoken. The Rendezvous des Cajun, like a French version of the Grand Old Opry, became a Saturday night staple to the Cajun French world. At 6 p.m., folklorist Dr. Barry Ancelet took the stage as the master of ceremonies to an assortment of entertainment ranging from Cajun bands and comedians to interviews on the subject of Cajun culture, music, and language. The program, now in its 27th year, is known far and wide, carried live on local public radio station KRVS and on their website, krvs.org. The audience comes to dance and hear the show, to talk French and see who's visiting from around the world. After 26 years as MC, Professor Barry Ancelet has retired. So rotating hosts keep the Rendezvous de Cajan going at the Liberty Center for the Performing Arts, still commonly known as the Liberty Theater. Michelle Captour composes beautiful blown glass pieces with inspiration from an unlikely source, her dog. Reporter Katrina Sarson learns how Captur goes beyond the traditional notions of art and infuses a sense of personal connection into every creation. We're just outside Ben at the studio of glassblower Michelle Captor. She's working with her dog Sarah on agility skills while the furnace heats up. She says it's all part of her creative process. When I work with Sarah, I have to totally focus on my body, what I'm doing, because she's reading everything I, the way I move, that's how I direct her around here. These are the weave poles behind me. I'll tell you, it took, I don't know, a year to train her to do that. Yay, good girl. But the first time she went through them straight, it was like, whoa! I was beside myself. Um, she was a pretty happy girl about it all. Free, over. But what does all this have to do with blowing glass? In the studio, I'm inviting the glass to become my vision. And uh, it's a working process where I say, let's do this. And it says, mm, OK, or no, maybe this. But out here, she's ready. She's looking at me. Those eyes are ready. 
she is inviting me to be a part of her. I kind of get to be her glass in a way. Her elegant blown glass pieces showcase light and design. Michelle's other work, though, is a little different. Colorful glass memorial pieces called soul bursts. A soul burst is a, a piece of commemorative glass that I make. It has someone's ashes in it or a pet. I think it's part of the grieving process. Today, she's creating a soul burst to honor a client's brother. This is a starting point for me. It's not a road map, but it's the beginning of a trail. It helps me wake up and go, yeah, how about those colors? I like those colors. These are what the ashes look like. People will mail me about a teaspoon of ash and I put it on my marber and I collect it. And there is a point where we will roll the glass in it and it will stick to the glass. And that's on top of the color generally afterwards. And then I put clear glass over it and create the shapes. The eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 marked the first time Michelle used ash in a glass piece. We collected some Mount St. Helens ash and I created a piece that was like a little painting. It had a mountain in the foreground and it physically had ash coming out of it and a little full moon. And you could feel the ash on the surface. Michelle discovered the art of blowing glass in 1975 at Alder House, a glass blowing studio in Lincoln City. And I walked into that studio and I was totally mesmerized by the glass in the process and, you know, it was like an addiction. It just happened right then and there. Mark Gordon is Michelle's studio assistant. They've worked together for the past few years. Basically my job is to facilitate and give her a second set of hands and eyes and she comes up with an idea, gives her the ability to step her work up to the highest level it can be. I do all this planning, I play, I fiddle around, but then the moment of truth comes and I just shut up and I listen to whatever is inside and it says, take it or leave it, and I will take it or leave it. It's a lot, lot, lot of fun to blow glass with somebody, to do, to work as a team and to create something bigger than what you could make all by yourself. It's magical. I like this one. See how much more the ashes are a fluid part of it, that, that whitish, bubbly area. Now they really get to dance. Michelle usually mails the soul burst to a client. Today, though, a nearby friend has stopped by to pick hers up. Are you ready? I'm ready. It contains ashes from her mother. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, and it's just, it's light, and that's what's, that's what's important to me. Um, the thing I love about your glass in my home and in these is that your glass relates to the light, and I can't think of any better way to have my mom or others that I love than in the light. Exactly. So, thank you, that is beautiful. It's just a bit of joy. That would, my mom would like that. <laughs> Michelle's glasswork to me is a creation of light because I've watched her blow it and I've watched essentially fire and light come together from some small thing into some amazing piece. The soul burst is a perfect thing for her to do. It is a burst of light. It, it is light holding, in this case, something very special. Every 
day we get to come in and we get to work with a wonderful material, hot glass, and create beautiful colored objects. Um, they can be very complex or very simple. So it's actually quite amazing to create something with your hands and have something live on longer than you. And to be a part of it is, is very exciting. What I'm really doing is trying to create the prettiest little painting in that little spot in a way that's going to be beautiful and that's going to give you joy when you look at it. And that's hard because it's going to be really sad at first. But I want it to be a celebration. To explore more of Michelle Captur's creations, visit soulbursts.com. And that wraps it up for this edition of Art Rocks. For more arts and culture, visit us at lpb.org slash artrocks, where you'll find feature videos and information on upcoming arts events. Until next time, I'm James Fox Smith from Country Roads magazine, and thanks for watching.